Good morning, Chris Ohl, Infectious Diseases, Wake Forest Baptist Health. So it is the 29th of October. Uh, a little creepy here in Winston-Salem, tropical storm coming through, remnants of Zeta, I believe it is. Uh, so you might see the lights flicker here and there. Um, it's not Halloween, it's the storm, I think, anyway. Um, so I uh, wasn't here last week, so hopefully everyone had a good week off. Um, but uh, so let's talk about what's happened in the interim. So uh, big news here in, uh, in, uh, in the country actually is uh, what's happening with our case numbers. Um, as predicted by many, um, the cases have been going up um, across the country as the weather gets colder. Um, and, and still the really, really hard hit states um, are the, uh, uh, the upper Midwest, near West. Uh, and some of the western states, um, and uh, and we measure um, rates mostly by the number of people infected per hundred thousand people. Because if obviously if you have a very populous area, you're going to have more cases just because it's more populous. But it may be that only ten percent of the population has gotten it. But uh, right now, what's happening in some of these midwestern states is that the rate is up over 100. So if you look at North Dakota and South Dakota, for instance, who, who are battling to be the lead in the country from week to week, it's uh, about 110 cases per 100,000 people. And that's pretty darn high. So even though the states aren't all that populous, the number of people proportionally getting infected are pretty high. To, just to compare, I looked at Forsyth County late last week. We're roughly around 18, maybe between 18 to 20 per 100,000. So if you compare that to North Dakota, at 110 per 100,000, uh, it, it puts it a little bit in perspective. Um, we, uh, why, why, is, uh, why are we having more cases across the country? Um, well, there's, a, there's probably three reasons. One is, is uh, that, uh, the, that people are getting a little bit fatigued of, uh, of COVID and have put off um, small social gatherings and, um, and such, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, a little bit more, but people are getting together more. Um, two is that uh, people are coming indoors more as it gets cooler, colder. It's harder to be outside where it's safer, and they're bringing their small social events inside. Families hang out more inside together rather than outside. So instead of playing basketball in the driveway with the kids, um, you're indoors watching, uh, watching TV or something, and, um, and transmission is higher. The states that are having the biggest problem that are really wrestling with it are ones that have not really embraced mask wearing, social distancing, or reducing the number of people in gatherings. Um, and, um, and that's, the, I think, one of the primary factors that's differentiating why certain infection, why the infections are occurring in certain parts of the country more than the others. So here in the southeast, we had our big peak um, in the second week of July, if you'll remember, um, and had declined since then. Most places now are, are up around that peak again. Um, so for instance, here in Forsyth County, we climbed back up to, uh, to uh, where we were in the second part of July and have been there now for a couple weeks. Um, and uh, with one exception I'll mention in a minute. Um, but the counties around us um, actually are, if you look at their numbers um, of cases, they're roughly two to three times higher than they were in, uh, in, in the second week of July, which was the southeast peak. So for those of you in the area, you'll recognize the names, Davidson, uh, Randolph, um, Yadkin, Davie, Surrey, Stokes, Rockingham, um, and to some extent Wilkes. Um, and, and so if you look at those numbers being two to three times higher than they were in July than they are now, even though these counties are more rural but not as populous, those numbers add up, um, and, um, and, uh, and it makes a big difference. If you look at the number of cases per 100,000, and you can do that, um, like you, the New York Times website's probably the easiest, but there are others also. 
where you can f look at the number of cases per 100,000. Most of these sites will put um, the higher case numbers per 100,000 in red and the uh, lower in green. So here in Forsyth County, um, if you look at cases per 100,000, we're, we're pretty much green. But the, cow the counties around us a lot are either in orange or, or most in orange, a couple in red. And which means that there's a lot more transmission going on in the rural areas. This was mentioned yesterday by Mandy Cohen uh, here in the state of North Carolina that it's the rural areas now that are really driving our, um, our cases transmissions in North Carolina. Again, they may not be as populous, but proportionately there's more cases, more transmissions occurring in these areas. So I was talking to some of our health directors here in the last week and saying, hey, you know, what are you seeing on the ground when you do your contact tracing and your case inv investigations? They say mostly still it's people know where they got their COVID or they have a high degree of suspicion where they got it. Um, and uh, it's uh, in workplaces. Um, and in the workplace, it's usually in the break room or the lunch room. Um, because people are, for the most part, wearing masks in other areas. But when you get in the break room or the lunch room, masks come down, people like to be social. It's human nature to hang out in the break room or the lunch room, maybe longer than you're supposed to be, maybe not. And, uh, and transmissions are occurring there. And, and I think this is what um, has happened actually at our Hall of Justice in the courthouse here in Forsyth County where we've had now up to four, I think it's around 14 cases associated with the courthouse. A lot of that was in break room, lunch room, and, and briefing rooms um, where the transmission was occurring. And that, by the way, has resulted in reduced services and more of a limited court schedule at Forsyth County until that gets, gets under control, which I think it will pretty soon. Um, other workplaces have found the same thing. The health directors will say households, a lot of cases occurring in households um, and extended households. Hey, I got together with my kids, you know, the other day who, you know, live in, um, let's just say Orange County and they came over to visit and, we, you know, we, we played with the grandkids um, and then they called the next day. Hey, sorry, um, you know, Johnny had COVID, um, you know, he can't go to work today. So you guys are all now. Uh, need to talk to people about going on quarantine. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of, a fair amount of household transmission. Small social gatherings. People aren't really having the huge parties that we've talked about not having, but they're having small social gatherings. Let's get together and watch football on Sunday. Let's have a beer together and watch a couple games. And you know, it's three or four friends from the neighborhood. Um, those things in the summer probably were more likely to be outside. Now they're more inside. So th these are the things to, to think about. Bars and restaurants. Um, uh, yes, there have been cases related to bars, which, you know, opened up under uh, the phase three opening, what, three, four weeks ago. Um, and I can tell you that a lot of the bars aren't, um, aren't following the limitations that are supposed to be um, being followed for the numbers of people and, uh, and outside versus inside. And so people are going to have to look at that and make their own decisions about whether that seems wise. Lastly is churches. And I mentioned this um, in that churches really have come up as, as, a, as an area where transmission is occurring. Churches were, um, were doing mostly virtual services until this fall and then so over the fall, I think a lot more are opening up, and um, and there a lot of them aren't completely following social distancing and masking policies, and they're having social interactions, potluck, you know, potlucks maybe, um, or other social interactions affiliated with the with the with the service, um, and we're seeing more and more transmissions related to churches. One. One notable one was in Charlotte, which was a super spreader event and resulted in the church being ordered to be closed by Mecklenburg County. So for those people um, who are involved in, in faith-based activities, time to get out the, uh, the CDC recommendations and make sure you're following them. Space people out in the pews or in the chairs. Um, uh, limit singing. 
Singing is, a, is really a way that where respiratory droplets can get out in there in the air. Uh, make sure everyone's masking, and this includes in, in church entry and church exiting. If you're having Bible study meetings before and after, you need to stay distanced and masked. It's really important to follow these details. Um, and if it's really hard for, uh, for your church to do this um, or your place of worship to do this because of geographic or, or uh, engineering limitations, it's best just to go back to being virtual. One of the things that we've seen with the change in the way the cases have been going in, in, in um, the epidemiology here in our area is that well, in July we were seeing um, COVID more in younger people in the hospitals. Um, the people who are getting admitted to the hospitals tended to be younger, they tended to be healthier, and, and, um, and their hospital stays tended to be shorter, and they were less likely to go to the ICU. Unfortunately, even though our cases in Forsyth County are roughly about the same they were that time in July, the, the, the cases have shifted to an older population and to a less healthy population. And our hospitals are more full than they have been probably at any other time during COVID um, during the past couple weeks. Um, and uh, this is something that worries me because if the older people are getting it and the people with multiple morbidities are getting it, that means the, the hospitals are getting, you're having more hospitalizations. The ICUs have more people in them. And if people admitted to the ICU with COVID have a tough time and, uh, and the mortality is pretty high in that group. Um, and so I think our deaths are gonna start going up in the next week or two in our area because of this shift to demographics. Why is this happening? It's happening just because of what I've just been talking about. Transmissions in households where older people are or people who have underlying other diseases, diabetes, lung disease, heart disease, kidney disease. Transmission in churches tend to involve older people. Um, older people generally have been trying to stay a little bit safer during COVID, but now that the places of worship and other places are coming open, they're going out. And then also with the cases going more in rural areas. Um, in rural areas, the percent of the population is older is higher. And, um, and this is worrisome to me. What do we need to do to, to get this under control? Um, it's, it's really simple and it's no different than what we've been talking about. It's, it's social, personal distancing, staying apart from other people limiting your gatherings to your own bubble or a bubble you know very, very well and sticking to that, not only in the household, but in the workplace. And lastly is masking. I know masking's become a very divisive and political thing, but you know, it just doesn't need to be. Masks work. And if you can help me get the word out that we need to be masking, It'll make a huge difference. And it'll really help us get through this late fall and winter. Um, and I, I really, really is, I'll even use the word plead. We need to be masking. We know what works. We just need to do it. If we can do it, rather than rates going up, they'll start sliding down again. We need to be careful and we need to mask. Um, how, are the, how are the schools doing? Schools are, are overall doing pretty well. If you look at the, um, at the state website, um, there are, um, you know, you'll find some clusters in schools. What's happening in, in these schools is that, um, is that k kids get identified, they, they get it at home or from their social networks, particularly on the older kids. And then, um, and then they go to school and they're asymptomatic and then two days later they test positive and because they were in a school within 48 hours they're included as a case and then that puts up as a transmission. So the transmission's not occurring in the school, it's occurring in the, in the households and social areas around the school. But when the child then goes to school it's counted as a case. 
So um, school transmission is unusual. It's unusual in our area. It's unusual in the state, and it's unusual across the country. And then if you're looking at Europe right now, which is struggling some again with COVID, what they're closing are their bars and their restaurants and their areas for social gatherings for adults, but they're leaving their schools open and they're doing fine with it. They've prioritized their kids' education rather than adult uh, recreation activities, I guess I'll put it. Um, and um, I think that's an important thing to remember as we move forward. So if you're a follower of the, of the uh, state uh, uh, COVID dashboard and you look at Forsyth County, you'll see last Saturday this huge spike in the number of cases in Forsyth County. And then it came back down again. What was that all about? What that was is it reflected a bump in cases that we've had at Wake Forest University here. Um, and, um, and that those numbers went through the health department and then they went to the state and the state plopped them into the dashboard all on the same day on Saturday of last weekend. And so it was a whole week's worth of saved up cases that went in on Saturday and that's why that big bump. So there was, there was an increase in cases at Wake Forest University um, and it involved um, off-campus um, students and off-campus activities and then uh, some transmissions to on-campus students. Um, th that actually uh, resulted in a uh, increase in the um, operating level from yellow at Wake Forest to orange, which is the way they advise their faculty, staff, and students about COVID activity on campus. And, it ref and it, they started to um, to limit activities and to really work with students to limit those off on campus interactions. And the cases have come back down again um, uh, after uh, isolating and quarantine a, a fair number of students in order to prevent further transmission on campus. So it's pretty much back down to baseline. And that shows that uh, colleges who react quickly uh, and have the resources uh, can control COVID on their campuses. Other universities that are uh, still open in the state, Duke, uh, Elon, Davidson come to mind, uh, and they're all doing fairly well too with uh, hiccups here and there, kind of like what Wake Forest had last week. But in general, I think everybody who is still open right now and who's doing okay right now is gonna make it through the semester. And that is great news for students, great news for faculty, great news for the schools. Um, I got a question um, via email over the last week and I want to read it because I think it's, it's worth bringing up because I get this question a lot. My husband and I, along with our 10-year-old son, all had COVID this summer. I'm in the Wake Forest Research Study and I'm continuing to show antibodies each month. Would it be safe to spend time with my father who is in his 70s? Could I pick up COVID in the grocery store, for example, and then pay, pass it to my dad if I went to visit him? or would my antibodies negate the virus? So if you have antibodies and you have been identified as being antibodies, it's because you were exposed in the past. Um, we think that mostly that, that, um, that reinfection in people who have antibodies and who have been previously infected will, uh, will more likely than not get, not, more likely than not, not get COVID again. That's a triple negative, I think. In other words, it's going to be le much less likely that you'll get COVID again if you've had it in the past. However, it's not 100% impossible. Um, and the best data we have says for three months. So if you had it last April, it's still not clear because we haven't um, um, analyzed all of the, those cases yet. But uh, for sure in the last three months, it's much less likely. However, it's not impossible. There have been some cases of reinfections. Personally, I know of one uh, in our area here. It's unusual, but it does happen. Um, so could you get it in a grocery store? Um, you know, if you're masking and if everyone around you is masking and you're doing hand hygiene all the time, actually a grocery store is not all that high risk. Uh, it's going to be when you have bubble intersections and social or family activities where the risk goes up. So you still need to be careful. You still need to wear your mask um, and you still need to say, hey, you know, 
that place looks a little crowded to me. Or, you know, I, I really want to go to church, but no one else is masking and they're not personally distancing. I think I'll stay home today and watch it on, t on YouTube or, what, or on, uh, on, on the tablet. But um, um, so you still have to be careful. You still have to do um, the things that we are advising for everyone else. But because you have antibodies, actually, it is probably less likely. So I'd say yes. You can if you're if you're doing if you're being safe in your activities otherwise, um, and uh, and limiting uh, your social interactions, and wearing your mask. I think you can visit your dad. Um, as long as your dad's doing the same thing, but uh, so anyway, I, I think that's a good um, a, a good question because even when we start getting vaccinated, even when more and more and more people have been affected, um, we're going to still be saying you need to wear your mask, you need to personally distance uh, until the whole population as a whole is pushed down the curve significantly. And that probably won't happen until near the end of next year. So, um, so we'll be doing this for a while. Um, and uh, it's, it, we still just are going to have to remember it. A couple of big things coming up. Um, first of all, Thanksgiving. Are you planning your Thanksgiving travel? If you do, pl plan wisely. All right. So here's my suggestions for what to do at Thanksgiving. Um, have it around the home. Have it around, you know, your place uh, where you live. Um, try, to, try to negate long distance travel. Uh, two um, is think about who you're going to have Thanksgiving with. You know, most people when they have Thanksgiving, the guests uh, and the uh, family members stay in the household. And sometimes they have to share rooms or share areas so people get together they're close by. This is the virus loves transmitting in this kind of situation. During the time of eating, Thanksgiving meals are long, masks come down. A lot of people are in a small area, kind of, you know, you're setting up card tables and things. Um, the virus loves to transmit in those settings. So you've got to keep the numbers down. Um, I, my suggestion, and this is purely my suggestion, is keep it to your family unit, or if you're going to have a family member, have one bubble that you intersect with and know that bubble well and what they do and what risks they have. Um, and, and still um, do things to keep it safe. Do it outside if you can. Um, keep the eating time. Um, short, spread people out, you know, maybe have some one bubble people eat in the living room, you guys eat in the dining room, you know, things like that. You know, watch a football game together, spread out, mask. You're indoors, it's much higher transmission activity. But I, I think going any more than just one simple bubble is, is not a good idea. And I'm not alone, I mean all public health people are saying that. Lastly, Halloween's coming up, um, and um, we've talked about that quite a bit before. Um, and um, and I know I've seen a lot of great ideas. Rather than having trick or treating, having sca scavenger hunts in the yard, in the backyard, or around the house, for your own kids. If you have one bubble you pod up with, for uh, instance, for for. Um, um, online learning with your kids and they're together every day anyway. You know, those would be the people you want to have Halloween with. Stay masked, stay personally distanced. If you're gonna trick or treat, find a few friends that you know and trick or treat in a way where there's not, you know, people getting within six feet of each other. And keep it outside, no parties, um, and uh, unless you're partying with your own family which can be a lot of fun, by the way. It's like a big family game night. Find a bunch of good Halloween games, uh, do it at home, brings the family together, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to it myself. So I love a good Halloween, uh, but I'm gonna do it safely. So um, with that, I think I'll go ahead and open it up uh, if there's any questions. I do have some about sports. 
First one is, what in your opinion will be the most difficult sports season to safely execute and why? Well, what in my opinion, boy, WXII has given to you some good questions this morning. <laughs> Uh, what would I think would be the, the hardest uh, sports season to, compl to complete to execute? Well, a few of them are ongoing and they're showing us that they're tough. Uh, well, you know, football, uh, both college and professional, um, there's been a couple professional teams that have had some hiccups and some fines that look really big to me, but to them they probably don't look so big. Um, and, uh, and, you know, postponed games. Um, and. Uh, some athletes getting COVID, um, professional, f or, and then college football, we just saw that, um, you know, Wisconsin and Nebraska is going to have to cancel their game this weekend because of some cases on Wisconsin side. And, and it, you know, there have been other college uh, football team outbreaks. I think basketball is going to be um, hard also. Um, you, you saw the length that the NBA had to go to get their playoffs. I mean, they, it was really something. They, had, they spent a lot of time, money, and resources and basically put all their players in, in one big bubble and kept that bubble pretty, pretty tight. And they did get through the season. Will everyone be able to do that? I, I don't know. I think it's going to be hard. Um, you know, basketball's, um, the people who get together are doing it indoors. Um, if there's any spectators at all, um, they're going to be exposed to each other in their vehicles or in buses and so on and so forth. And I think it's going to be really hard to have basketball with spectators. Um, it's really hard to spread out uh, in, a, in a basketball arena and colleges are really going to have to think about that. Um, I, I think it's a super spreader event waiting to happen with basketball. Um, Hockey, it depends how it's done. Um, baseball is probably easier. You know, it's usually done outside and um, it's warmer. Um, and, but we um, won't, won't be having baseball for a while anyway, <laughs> even in a normal year. But I, I think basketball is going to be a tough one coming up. Uh, there's going to be a lot of COVID around this winter. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be hard to pull it off. I'm actually a little surprised football's gotten this far for the most part, um, but and it, it's been tough. I mean, the colleges are having to test their athletes three times a week. NFL does it even more. Um, there have been small outbreaks, um, games canceled. Students aren't really in the stands. Wake Forest won't be in the stands for a little bit yet, for instance. Um, and uh, so I think that's a tough one. Um, with most high school sports in, the North, in North Carolina pushed to 2021, what will it take for them to actually start and get through those seasons? So what will it take to get to, for, for high school sports, which mostly have been pushed off into 2021, what will it take for them to get through their seasons? Um, one, I think uh, being realistic about which sports can be done. Uh, and paying attention to detail with, um, um, with risk, what I call risk mitigation. In other words, the safety measures. So um, cross country, uh, tennis, you know, golf, sports like that, that are already distance, are gonna be a lot easier. Um, but you know, if you're busing a high school team to another place to have a competition, the bus could be the problem. Uh, and, and if you have one case on the bus, boom, you're going to have a whole busload of kids quarantined. It just takes one kid on there. It doesn't even mean there's going to be transmission on the bus, right? You're quarantined if you're exposed. So um, I, they have to do a lot of planning and thinking about what they want to do and how they want to do it. Uh, there was an article in the MMWR last week and then also um, my personal experience with a uh, sporting a small outbreak in a, sport, a sporting team in a college here in the area um, is that um, you can do everything perfectly around your sport and when everyone is under your supervision. So if you're the high, you know the football coach, you can make everyone do everything perfectly and be safe and everything. 
and their training and their and, and everything, their practice, their masking, their transport when they're under their supervision. But what happens is they go out and they socialize together, you know, after the game or before the game. And this happens even in high school. And then and then they get exposed and then there's a case that's positive and um, and and then three or four of their friends who they socialize with are also positive, but they all happen to be on the football team or on the cross country team or on, you know, whatever. And so you have the the social interactions which gave you the transmission. And then it take took the people out of that sport. And you know, if you have like I said before, if your whole offensive line in football is quarantined, it's tough to have a game. And uh, it'll be the same thing in basketball. If your two point guards are out, how are you going to have a game? It's, it's what they do after the game and around the game and in their social activities otherwise. So if you read the MMWR thing, it's a, it's a soccer team, college soccer team. And, um, and it turned out that they socialized together out and then they got four or five four or five of them got COVID, but they all happened to be on the same team and the team had to shut down their activities because of it. So if people want to have high school sports, uh, the, 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 the student athletes are going to have to toe to it um, in their social and family as well. And last question, do you think there's any chance fans will be able to attend games, specifically football? Yeah, do I think there would be any chance that fans can attend games, specifically football? I think if the number of cases in the in the um, in the in the football community is reasonable, you you could, and they're going to have to really spread out. So I mean, you've seen some NFL teams that have brought people into the stands, but there's just no way to do it with full capacity. I don't think we're going to be looking at full capacity stadiums for football. Um, until um, 2021, maybe even 2022, maybe even next fall will be hard. We'll have to see how things are going by then. Um, but um, it's going to be a while yet. Basketball, I just don't see how to do it. Either did the NBA. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anyone in the group? All right, we'll see you next week.